was a decent bacon roll, fellas, wasn't it? I mean, I, I do a lot of these breakfasts, and um, the breakfast, Christian men's breakfast, as you can imagine, um, go on a scale of, um, uh, of really good to not so good, shall we say. Um, well, that was a decent one. And we had proper coffee. Not a decaf in sight. Ain't that great? <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, uh, anyone from Norfolk here? Thank goodness for that. Um, I, I, I was in a place called Thetford in Norfolk a few years ago, and I, I, I like to get to places early. And I drove up there, and, um, and the guy's getting all the makings for the breakfast out of the back of his car. And I said, can I help you, brother? He said, oh, yeah. And he hands me a great big Tupperware. You remember Tupperware? Great big <laughs> Tupperware thing of, of, of fruit. And I looked at it, and it wasn't like, you know, fruit salad from a can. It was proper kiwis and all that, all chopped up. And I said, fruit? I said, uh, this is the men's breakfast, isn't it? He said, oh, yes. He said, we've even got yoghurt. So, <laughs> so some places it, it, it's tough. Listen, I, I <laughs> it's tough. You know, you have to endure the bread. But it was a, a lovely bacon roll this morning, yeah. Um, I, I'm here today to tell you a little bit about my life, how I, how I was, most of all what changed me, and really how I'm trying to live my life now. But let me tell you before we start that, um, everyone's got a story, fellas. Everyone's got a story. Many times when I, when I give my story, someone will come up to me at the end and go, oh, wish I had a story like yours. I say, do you? I say, no, you don't. I said, have you been a Christian most of your life? They say, yeah. I say, I wish I had a story like yours. Because then I would have followed Jesus Christ all the way from when I was young. And, and, and we, we, we shouldn't forget that. We shouldn't forget that everyone has got, and, we can, and that can be used by the Lord where, wherever we go or, or whatever we do. Um, I spent uh, a number of years with a, with a group of guys called Tough Talk, spent 10 years with, with them going around the country. They're, they're the guys that lift weights and, and, uh, and go into prisons and, and all that sort of stuff. And um, uh, <coughs> when Jim said to me, you've got about 30 minutes to speak today, I was a bit worried because the last prison I was in, three guys finished their sentence, Friday I finished talking, you know, so... Could be in for a long one, fellas, if, we, if it goes well. <laughs> and I spent um, a few years with uh, an organisation called Christian Vision for Men. I don't know if you heard of it. You, I think some of you went to uh, something that CVM do out in Swindon in the field. It's called a gathering. The 2,000 men gather together and uh, uh, get, get up to all sorts of Christian mischief <laughs> over there. So that's a great thing to, to, to be involved with. And for the last... Um, since sort of September and for the last couple of years, I've been involved with a thing uh, that's come over, originated in Texas. It's called Quest Life. It's, it's about uh, men and women just going a little bit deeper with their, with their faith. If they, you know, if you're invited to go a little bit deeper, uh, it's a five-day event. Uh, we're totally unplugged, and you can hear from the Lord in an amazing way. But I don't, has anyone been to Texas at all? Yeah, tonight. Have your brother? Yeah, yeah. Well, if you don't... <sighs> Texas was a shock to me. If, you, if, you, if you're a vegetarian, you don't like guns, and you don't like big trucks, Texas is not the place to be, is it? You know? And they said to me, they said to me they were, I was there, they said, hey, Simon, he said, do you know, Texas is three times the size of the UK. I thought, wow, you know, it is. It's a big place, isn't it? He said, I can get in my truck at sunrise, he says, and I'm still in Texas at sunset. I said, yeah, we've got a road like that. It's called the M25. <laughs> <laughs> Straight over the top of his head, didn't he? <laughs> before, I'll just tell one little story before we get into the, the, the serious stuff, really. And um, it's, a <clears throat> it's about a man and a woman. They loved each other very, very much. But the woman loved her cat more than she loved her husband, and she loved her mother more than... She loved her husband, so it was sort of cat, mother, husband. There's a few fellas nodding around. <laughs> she went away for a couple of weeks to, um, uh, to, look, to, to visit an old school friend. And she left her, uh, her husband in charge of the cat and in charge of her mother. And every, every night she'd ring home, she'd say, how's the cat? He'd say, oh, well, the cat's fine. How's the mother? Oh, the mother's fine. 
Halfway through the second week, she rings up. She says, how's the cat? He said, oh, the cat's dead. Whoa, crikey, she's gone into one. She's crying her eyes out. She can't get a breath, you know. She's, she's, he said, I couldn't say it any other way. The cat's died. She said, you could have broken it to me a lot more gently. He said, I don't understand. You could have said, she said, that the cat escaped through the cat flap when you weren't looking. It climbed up the drain pipe, it got onto the roof, it had been raining so its little claws couldn't grip, it fell off the roof, into the garden, you scooped it up, took it to the vet and to put it out of its misery, the vet put it to sleep. He said, oh, he said, I am sorry, I said, I do realise my mistake. She said, um, anyway, she said, how's the mother? <laughs> he said, well, the mother got out the cat flap, crying up. <laughs> <laughs> Fellas, <laughs> I was born in a place called Burton-on-Trent, which is up in the Midlands near, near Derby. Um, to this day, I, I don't know who my uh, biological father is. I don't know who he is. Uh, my mother married a guy when I was four years old, and uh, that was my stepdad, and that's the guy that I called my father. Um, there was not a lot of love shown during those early years or, or any time during my life. I didn't really think much of that, I didn't know anything different. But you know, I played rugby to quite a high standard. I, you know, I played for the, the county, the Midlands, and on the verge of England at, as a schoolboy, uh, and my father never came to see me once. I didn't think much of that either, until I had my own boys and I wanted to get out and watch them play sport whenever I can, c could, you know. I don't think it was their fault, I think it was a generational thing. I just think stuff gets passed down through generations if we don't stop it and it, sadly wherever I go sometimes that, that's not unusual I, I remember speaking to a guy in Colchester big old lump his name was Trevor and he said uh, my dad was in the military and he never had a good word to say about me he said he was always putting me down said that I'd never achieve anything in my life never do anything with my life he said when he died he said all his military friends were in the grave and they looked at me and they said, are you Trevor? I said, yeah. He said, they said, your dad couldn't stop talking about you. Couldn't stop telling you how much he, he loved us. See, he could, he could say it to them, but he couldn't say it to his own son. I don't know if you're a father or a grandfather here, but do you know something? I think we've got to tell our kids and our grandkids that, that we love them as much as we can, no matter how old they are, because if we don't, you know, no one else will. And if you're a Christian man here today with a son, I would think about giving him your blessing, you know, because that goes a long, long way. It's biblical, passing it on. Well, in 1976, I know if there's just a couple of guys here old enough to remember that year, um, I, came, <laughs> I came to London to join the Metropolitan Police. Why did I join the Met Police? Well, I've been watching a program at the time called The Sweeney. Do you remember that? <laughs> Not the new one, but the old one with Reagan and Carter and all that lot. So, and I thought I was going to go straight into the flying school. It didn't quite work out like that. Um, when I came to London, I, um, I had to join, uh, I had to walk the beat. I was in a place called Finsbury Park, North London. That's where I started off. Holloway. Is, they, they, the brother's nodding. He knows. I thought I recognised your face, brother. <laughs> <laughs> It's a shirt. No, that's what it was. <laughs> um, but you know, what happened was, because I grew up with no love, it made me have a very, very hard heart. My heart was like granite. I didn't do anything for anyone unless there was something in it for me. I wouldn't do anything for anyone unless I could see that there was something in it for me at the end of it. When I've I, then I did a little bit in East London. I came back into central London and worked on the buses. They call it a territorial support group, which is the nearest thing we got to a riot squad. We had the shields and all that, and took out the nasty pieces of work. Um, and then I uh, ended up um, in, uh, in North London. Um, but I was about the furthest away from being a Christian in the police force I've ever been in my life. Why? I'm ashamed to tell you, <coughs> I, I used to swear on the Bible in court. It meant nothing to me. It might have been a copy of FHM, Woman's Weekly, or The Sport in Life. That's how much it meant to me. I was a Metropolitan Police boxing champion, and I would play rugby for the police, and in them days, I fought for the police and drank for the police. It was that sort of macho environment, and I was the first one in, last one out. They used to use me 
It was a battering ram, you know, it had a bit of metal on it, you just smash into doors and go for them. You know, I had a, I had a great time in the police force. Um, but one theme ran through my police career, and that was football. I did an awful lot of football duty. I spent 10 years over at the Arsenal. <laughs> uh, I know there's a couple of fellas in here this morning, I know that. Wherever I go, there's always an Arsenal support, except... I did a talk on a dodgy council estate in Hume in Manchester once. And I said, any, Ar any Arsenal fans in here? I nearly got chased out of the building. You've got to be... <laughs> people get passionate about these things, don't they? I don't know why. Um, in those days, I had a great big moustache. And they called me the walrus over at the Arsenal. <laughs> God, here comes the walrus. You know, and, and, and at those d in those days, um, they played at Highbury, the old ground. And they had a big terrace where people stood. And it held about 20,000 people. And whenever, whenever Arsenal played a London club, there was always a big fight in there. Because everyone had the same accent. Everyone, no one wore the colours. And I've had many battles in there with Chelsea, Millwall, West Ham. I struggle saying that word Tottenham. It sort of chokes me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> them, them as well. But I thought that blue uniform at the time, gentlemen, I thought that made me... I thought that made me um, uh, Superman. I thought I was Iron Man. I thought I was invincible. Nothing could touch me. Nothing could hurt me. One game changed that. It was a game between Arsenal, West Ham United. May the 2nd, 1982, three weeks before I was due to get married. West Ham at the time had the most organised set of hooligans that there was in the country. They called themselves the Intercity Firm or the ICF for short. And they came into grounds and they attacked... Um, uh, opposition fans like a military operation and this time they came into the North Bank from all sides top bottom trapped the Arsenal fans in the middle let off a great big red smoke bomb I've got pictures of all this some video footage of all this at home I was the first copper in the middle of that smoke bomb and when they saw me my friends were my colleagues were a little bit uh, slow to catch up when they when these guys saw me instead of fighting each other they picked on me and I was very fortunate to get out of there without any serious injury. And we used to love them old, as a copper, we used to love them old derby days because we used to enjoy getting stuck in. You know, we had a, in the time, we had a little thing called a truncheon, not much bigger than this microphone, but we was quite handy with that and we'd get stuck right in. But this particular day, tables were turned a little bit. And the fighting around the ground that evening, a young man, I think his name was John Dickerson, got stabbed to death. Arsenal fan, all for a game of football. Now, back in the pub that night, I loved it when my colleagues would go, oh, did you see Pinchy, did you see the Walrus getting stuck in? I loved all that. See, that really fed into my ego, really fed into the, the pride and my old chest would go out. But when I got home, closed the door, and I was by myself, I thought, crikey. That was the first time I felt vulnerable. Three weeks after that, I did get married. I married a lovely lady called Linda. Did I love her? The answer is no. I didn't know how to love. She said, I love you. I say, me too. That was about as far as i go with that. We had two sons, Tom and Jamie. Did I love them? I care for them. I protect them. They were my sons, but I didn't know how to love. So the answer is no. And who knows? Who's here today? Who knows that just because you can make a, a baby don't make you a good father, does it? And that was where I was, you know. If I wasn't at work, I was socialising after work. If I wasn't socialising after work, I was playing rugby. If I wasn't playing rugby, I was socialising or training. I was very rarely at home. Everything else in my life was more important than my home life. It came pretty low down the scale of importance things. And who knows that every choice we make is a consequence. Every choice we make, something happens. And I made a choice to join a younger set of men. Well, I was working in North London. These guys were all single men. I don't know what it was. They call it the male menopause, don't they, or a midlife crisis. And I went, so I embraced it, straight in. And I started going out to pubs and clubs with these guys. Whilst I, you know, I had a family. I started drinking, started messing around with other women. And my wife well, didn't know what was going on. And in the end, you know, I'd be sitting at a table. It got so bad, I'd be sitting at a table with all my family around. 
and back in them days, we had the little pages. We didn't have the mobile phones so much. Do you remember them little pages? And they, it, a page would vibrate, and it would go off, and it would say, I want to see you tonight, and I'd lie for my teeth to get out of the house. That's how, uh, how bad it got. Well, I got fed up, and my wife continually questioning me, and I'm ashamed to tell you I left her. I left my wife at a time when her mother was seriously ill with cancer. Her mother was dying of cancer, and I walked out. To, to let her, leave her to look after her mother, look after the two boys, and hold down a full-time job. That's how selfish I was. And as I drove off the drive with all my stuff in the car, she was driving on, and the look on her face was, what have I done wrong? Well, she'd done nothing wrong, because it was all about me. Things got worse for me, because in a nightclub in North London, just off the A10 there, I had a fight with an off-duty police officer and knocked him to the floor and knocked his teeth out. And I found myself on a serious assault charge. They took away my badge. I couldn't work as a police officer. I was what they call suspended. Some 15 months later, I ended up going to a Crown Court in Woolwich with a judge and the jury of the Whigs. And after a five-day trial at 4 p.m. on the Friday, they came back with a not guilty verdict. If I'd been found guilty, I would have gone to prison, and prison for someone who had been a copper wasn't going to be a great place, was it? How I got that not guilty verdict was something they call post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD, which occurred in that football match I described to you, the West Arsenal-West Ham game. But even then, I was so selfish. I, I just I had an opportunity, and I walked away from the police because I thought, you know, I'd, I've done all this for you, and you... You know, you've, you've let me go to court and all that. And, and looking back on my life, if you're a Christian man here today, you'll recognize this term, a God-shaped hole. Looking back on my life, I had a God-shaped hole. I tried to fill it with everything. I haven't got time to tell you, go into detail about everything. I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd try, I had even tried steroids to build my body up. I'd gone into drink, recreational drugs. I really... I thought I was all out in a bag of chips, but my life was going down the pan. I was looking at something now that I thought, yeah, this is going to fill this hole here. And gentlemen, that was money and material things. You see, I left the camaraderie of the police force. I was training two or three times in a gym, and there was a group of guys there in Chigwell in Essex where I lived. A group of guys there also had pretty women around them. Nice cars, plenty of money, never worked. I wasn't silly. I knew what they was into. A little bit of criminality. I thought, yeah, that's for me. I enjoyed their company. I got a new camaraderie with these guys. And pretty soon we were going out doing a little bit of uh, low-level debt collecting, which wasn't governed by the Office of Fair Trading, if you understand what I mean. We'd knock on a few doors and get a couple of quid back for me. When they knew they could trust me with that, we'd get information, smash into place, and take lumps of cash. I could take more money in one night. I could earn three or four times in a year. And I had a bit of fun with that money. Yeah, I could have clothes, holidays, all that sort of thing. But do you know something what I learnt? Is that if you put money as your number one aim in life, you're always going to come up short. If you put money as your number one aim in life, you're never going to, you're never going to be satisfied. See, it's all right to have a few quid. It's not a problem. But if it's your priority, if it's your number one aim, there's a line in the Bible, isn't there, that many people misquote. They say money is the root of all evil. They miss out one word, don't they? You're right. The love of money. 1 Timothy 6.10 tells us the love of money is the root of all evil. I went out and bought myself a 4.7 litre Cherokee Jeep. It was all black, blacked out windows. The registration mark was W-A-R War. Cool, I thought um, I was Billy Big Bananas driving this thing around Essex, believe me. A couple of weeks after I bought it, they brought out a new model. I didn't want this car, I wanted the new model. Then I got the new model. I drove that around and I saw a Range Rover Sport and thought, yeah. If you put money and material things as your number one aim, you'll always end up. And I believe, as a Christian, if you put anything above God, it's idolatry and you're in trouble. Five things I learned about money, if you put it as your number one aim. If I can remember them this morning, I'll tell you. The more, you get, the more you get, the more you want. If you put it as your number one aim, the more you get, the more you want, the more you get, the more you spend. The more you get, the more you worry. The more you get, the more you lose. The more you get, the more you leave. 
You don't see a funeral car with a seven-bedroom mansion coming down the street, do you? Gentlemen, I would never leave my house without I had a monkey in my back pocket. Can anyone tell me how much a monkey is? No. I thought you were men of the world. <laughs> <laughs> It's keeping quiet. Uh, but a, a, a monkey is 500 pounds. Sometimes uh, I went out with a gorilla. Anyone know what a gorilla is? It's a very big monkey. Um, uh, <laughs> 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 Listen, just a, as a sidebar, I was telling that story. It a lovely, there were Tamil Christians in Manor Park, East London. I thought, oh, you bound, they're bound to know what a monkey is, you know. They're from East London. But I was working with an interpreter. You've got to be careful. <laughs> you have to be careful when you're working with an interpreter, don't you? I said, I never left my house without I had a monkey in my back pocket. And the interpreter looked at me and went, you had a monkey? <laughs> <laughs> we never got on the griller. It just didn't seem. <laughs> See, I'm not here today in, in Royal Tunbridge Wells to tell you that I was gangster number one. No, it wasn't like that. How it was was... It was a difference between me making a living from being a police officer to upholding law to me now making a living by breaking that law. And as a copper, we pushed the envelope, really pushed it, but never really went through the ceiling. With these guys I was with now, there was no ceiling. There was no moral compass. There was nothing at all. Let me give you, I'll describe to you. What happened? I was um, with a guy, and he owned a pub in Bethnal Green, East London. A guy came into his pub. He disrespected him. He knocked. So this guy jumped from behind the bar, knocked him to the floor, and jumped on top of him, took out a knife, and cut his face. And had to be pulled off before he did anything worse. That's the sort of people I was now associating with. And who knows? You know, there's no honour among thieves, especially where a pound note is concerned. Because you may have heard that term, you've got to speculate to accumulate. And they said to me, because I wanted more, I was pressuring them all the time, because none of this stuff was satisfying me. None of this money, it was just like a black hole, it was disappearing. None of this money was satisfying me, so I was pressurising them to do more and more stuff. And I said to these guys, and they came up with a plan, and I put a lot of this money I'd taken from other people into this scheme. But, you know, they took that money, and that was the last I saw of it. I went out to Spain to Port Banus, Marbella, if you know that part of the Costa del Sol, to try and get it back, but I realised it had gone. So I came back, and I picked the phone up and said, I don't have nothing more to do with you. See, one-on-one, -on -one I could have a go at these guys, but not in a group that come after me and everything I held dear. So I threw the phone away and walked away from them. And that left me the lowest I'd ever been in my life. You see, they'd taken away everything, but most of all, they'd taken away the... The hope I had of becoming a, a happy, self-centred sort of person. I, that was, that's what I was looking for. They'd taken away all of that. And I was left with nothing, large amount of debt, because credit cards and stuff like that, and, 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 and no way of, of paying it back. The police will follow me on a daily basis, because they'd seen one of their own guys had gone bad. And the villains now didn't trust me because they thought I was going to grass them up, which couldn't have been further from the truth. I was like I was strung up between two wild horses. If someone had said, go, I was on the very edge of the pit. One more step, I was gone. I was either going to end up in a shallow grave in Epping Forest or do a very heavy prison sentence. And I know that's the truth because I was at a, a conference in Cambridge a couple of years ago and a guy from Ireland came up to me and I'd never seen him before in my life. And he said to me, Simon, he said, God wants to tell you he's protecting you. He said, twice men have left their homes to take your life. He said, he's protecting you and he's still protecting you to this day. And I can, when I look back, I can see where that was going to happen. I was on the edge, the very edge. But that's where God threw me a lifeline. And that's where all that other stuff in my life stops and a new life begins. And he threw me a lifeline, the only possible way I would have, could have uh, uh, received it. I was in that same gym I've talked about. I was angry, very angry. And I don't know if you've ever had something on your mind 24 hours a day, where you wake up with it. You can't go to sleep because it's on your mind. And I was plotting and planning. All reason had gone out of my head. I was going to take these guys out. 
Anger had turned into resentment. What, did, what does Nelson Mandela say? What did he say about resentment? He said it's like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. I was locked in a cage of anger and resentment. I'd smash the punch bag, but nothing. It would go for a couple of minutes, but it would still be there. And as I was storming out this gym, I looked over and there was a guy in a running machine. It was the same guy that attacked the man in his pub. But this guy, gentlemen, had turned his life around through his faith in Jesus Christ. And the peace that was on him was like no other feeling. His life at that moment in time made me hungry. It made me hungry for what he got. I'm ashamed to tell you I used to take the mickey out of that guy, but not now. I'm looking at him in a completely different way. I was rock bottom and this guy had peace. Here's a, here's a thing. Is your life making anyone hungry? Is the way you live in your life, are people going, there's something different about that guy, I want to know more about him. The guy who this guy had attacked is a good friend of mine. His name's Jeff. He's got, walking around with a scar from here all the way down to his mouth. He's also a born-again Christian, and there's been reconciliation between the two. Now, that can only happen through the Lord, isn't it? So I went over and I started talking to this guy, and pretty soon we were going out, having a bit of breakfast, and I was inquiring into this faith thing that had changed this man so much. One time he said to me, he said, Simon, he said, you've got to stop blaming everyone else in your life. You've got to stop blaming your parents, the police, the people that rip you off, your family. You've got to take a long, hard look at yourself. Pretty much like the Michael Jackson song, you know. The man in the mirror, you know, go, the words to that go, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make the change. But he kept banging on about going to church. Well, fellas, church wasn't really on my radar. I thought all Christian men were dodgy geezers with, who wore sandals and socks. I'm looking around this morning, it's probably a little bit cold today, but <laughs> when the sun starts to come out, you'll see them. They'll be about, yeah. You see, sandals are okay, fellas. Socks are okay. Don't put the two together. It's not a fashion statement unless you come from Norfolk or somewhere like that. And a Christian with a guitar, you know, that was my worst nightmare. And a Christian with sandals, socks and a guitar, whoa, we're in trouble now, aren't we? But he, <laughs> he persuaded me. And um, February the 10th, 2002, I ended up going to his church, which was a church called the Holy Trinity Church in Brompton Road, Knightsbridge. They call it HTB. I don't know if you've, many of you probably have heard of that church. When I walked through, I was wrecked. When I walked through the doors of that church, the peace that hit me was like no other feeling. Wow. That evening I said a prayer with a guy called Nicky Gumbel. I didn't know who he was, but I now know he's a vicar of that church, and he fronts up a Christian course called Alpha, which I believe is starting a men's Alpha on Monday night here. I said a prayer. Now, when I said that prayer, because I knew all about hell, I didn't know much about heaven. I was wrecked. When I said that prayer, I knew I had to change. I knew it wasn't just say a little prayer and, and carry on. No. That life that I was leading had to change. That life that I was in, all the hurt and the nonsense had to stop. I knew it had to stop. It couldn't carry on. And that prayer changed all that. I knew it wasn't just sticking my hand up and, uh, and answering an, uh, a, a call. No, and then carrying on with the rest of my life. No, I knew there was something called a godly sorrow, which, was, which, which we call repentance. Had to happen. And that, that prayer was a simple prayer. It was, Heavenly Father, forgive me for all the nonsense and hurt I've caused. I now turn my back on all that, and I accept your Son, Jesus Christ, into my life to be my Lord and Saviour from this day forward. I knew I had to change. Couldn't have gone on like that. That summer, I ended up going on that Christian course called, called Alpha. And just before I got on, I, I, just before I went, I got back with my wife, <coughs> only because I got nowhere else to go. And bless her, she took me back into the marital home. I said to her a couple of years ago, I said, do you ever remember that course I went on, that Alpha course? She said, yeah. I said, did you ever see a difference in me? She said, I saw a difference in you from the very first night you went on that course. She said, I thought it was all going to end up in a dead end like everything else in your life, but it didn't. And in 2010, gentlemen, we renewed our wedding vows. So God heals and God restores. 
You see, on that course, I didn't learn about religion. I didn't learn about tradition. But I learned a scumbag like me, if I was truly sorry for all the things I'd done, could find forgiveness. It was a God that wanted to forgive me. Ain't that amazing? But not only that, and this blows me away every single day I get up, there was a God who wanted to know me. He wanted a personal relationship with me through his son, Jesus Christ. Ain't that amazing? He wants to know us through his son. We can, through his son, Jesus Christ, we can walk into the temple. We can walk into the throne room. That's just amazing. Now, I don't know, uh, on, on this particular course, they have a weekend away where you learn about the Holy Spirit. I was just getting my head around Jesus and God now they're talking about the Holy Spirit, not quite sure where, where all that's leading. But when I went there, I was still hanging on to a little bit of bitterness from these guys that ripped me off. But when I asked the Holy Spirit into my life, all that went. I was left the most incredible feeling of peace I've ever felt in my life. I'd had peace before when Arsenal went in and I had a few quid in my pocket. That was my kind of peace. I couldn't stay the whole weekend. Because on the Sunday I was playing rugby at Twickenham. I don't know if you know, it's where England played their own games. and It was a special game and I was invited to play. And it was great. I'd played rugby all my life and to jog out onto the Twickenham pitch was amazing. But it was nothing compared to the feeling of peace and love I felt when the Spirit of God entered my life on that Saturday night. I had been searching all over. I'd been searching all some, you know, I can't have time today to tell you all the different things I'd been searching through. But I'd been searching i found something now. I'm here today to tell you i found something. i found something and that, that's made me whole. i found something that's made me complete. And what's that? It's the love of Jesus. I'm well over six foot tall, knocking on 19 stone. But I'm telling you about a love that I've found that's made me much, much stronger. Not weaker, like the world wants you to believe. I've got a friend who's with me. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. 366 on leave, yeah. Someone who doesn't love me because of the football team I support, the car I drive, the money I've got. No, he loves me because he paid me. Now, I've, I've been introduced to a few of you and know a few of you by name, but listen to me. God knows every single one of you. God the Father knows every single one of you. Your sons. You're his sons. You don't have to live with anything anyone's ever said over your life. You're no good. You'll never achieve anything. You don't have to live with that stuff. My God sees you, not from the outside, but he sees you from the inside. He looks at the heart. What's he saying, Jeremiah? I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you. Not plans to harm you, but a little bit further down, it says, if you seek me, you will find me. But you've got to seek him with all your heart. He knows you. He knows every single one. He's got plans for every single one of you. And it don't matter how old you are. Because it ain't over till God says it's over. Did you know that? There is no retirement in the kingdom of heaven. Did you know that? But I didn't turn into Ned Flanders overnight. I'm not that... I'm not that tambourine bashing type of Christian. I said that in the Salvation Army the other day and you could see the tumbleweed float. <laughs> You've got to be careful what you say. I still do the wrong things. I still read the wrong things in the paper. I still watch the wrong things on the telly. I found myself watching Tottenham Hotspur the other day. You know, <laughs> you can tell how bad that is. Three things left me very quickly when I made that decision to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour. The lust for money left me, the love of drink left me, and swearing left me. But we're left with a, one or two things to, to struggle with, because none of us are perfect. And one of those things is a little bit of anger, which sometimes manifests itself in the shape of road rage. Um, if someone cuts me up on the, on the way down here, fortunately, there wasn't many cars on the road this morning, but if someone cut me up, I don't say, oh, bless you, brother. You know. If someone nips in, into my parking space as I'm... Probably into Tesco, so it would probably be Waitrose around anyone. So uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't say, oh, your need is greater than mine, brother. No. And if I get out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning and stub my toe, I don't say, ouch, that hurt a bit. No, we react, don't we? We're, we're blokes. We react. We, we're, we're Christian. But we're blokes, you know. I'll tell you how bad it got um, very, very quickly. When I did that Alpha course, and believe me, if you are on the fence about going on this men's alpha course, please step off the fence and get involved with it because 
it, it, it's an amazing it's an amazing course and, and it's uh, really uh, the fruits of it are just absolutely tremendous um I, I went back and did the next one as a helper, and then all of a sudden they let, they let me lead on these Alpha courses at HTB, and I was doing three a year. They called me an alcoholic, I was doing so many, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I'd got this Christian thing cracked. Now, it's a dangerous place to be if you, you think you've got anything cracked. And, and I, at the time, I had a, he's passed now, but I had a 10 stone rock by the dock. And I had a little van, and I put him in the van, I'd take him to Epping Forest, and I was coming back one day. With the dog in the van, it was winter, I had a big coat on, woolly hat, and um, four young lads in a car pulled straight out in front of me, no indications or anything. And of course, I flashed them and tooted them, and they turned around to me and gave me a friendly wave. <laughs> so the old Christian head went off, it went on to red mist came down, I'm chasing these guys up the road. They're looking behind, I thought, no, oh, you're not going to get away from me. They pull into a cul de sac. They don't realise, they think it's a, a, a side road. I pull across the cul-de-sac, they can't get out. I jump out, get the dog out of the car, the dog's going berserk. I'm steaming across to these boys, they're putting the locks down on the cars. I thought, they ain't going to stop me, my fist is going straight for... I'm just about to reach the car, and suddenly I thought, hold on a minute, ain't you supposed to be a Christian? You just knocked it all out the window. I thought, oh, so I told the dog to sit, and I went over to these boys, and they're looking at me, I went... Oh, excuse me, fellas, could you use your mirrors and maybe your indicators next time, please? <laughs> God bless you. Anyway, well, <laughs> so, it's, a true, it's a true story. Put a dog in the car, drove around, oh, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. <laughs> you know, I don't know where you are with your faith, but if you made the decision for Christ this very morning, to accept Jesus into your life this very morning, you're not going to win the lottery tonight. It doesn't work like that. There's stuff we still struggle with. In prisons we say, you know, if you make a decision for Christ, you're not going to get parole tomorrow. It doesn't work. We still struggle with things. You know, but I would never go back to that mess I was in before. I struggle because I don't struggle alone anymore. I struggle with the, with the love of, of Jesus. You know, both of my boys since I was a Christian had trouble with drugs. One had problems with cannabis. Anyone tells you cannabis is harmless, they're telling lies. My boy lost four years of his life to that stuff at a time when he's when he should have been going to university, a very clever lad. How do we get rid of that? I didn't know. I just cried out to the Lord. He said, bring him to me. So I took him on an alpha course at HTB. He came. Halfway through the course, I saw someone praying for him in the name of Jesus, and that, alpha, that, and that addiction was broken. We still had to pick him up. We still had to love him and, 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 and carry on with him. The other fellow used to binge up on cocaine at the weekends. We didn't realize until all his finances became unraveled. And, and his mum rang me one night, she said, he's, um, he's been on that stuff again, wide out of his face. So, I, and as a father, I just raced home and I really, you know, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to punch the seven daylights, so knock some sense into him, you know. But as I raced upstairs, opened his doors, there he was standing there. And I thought, you know what, I love this lad. See, what God had done, he'd broken his heart up and he poured his flesh into it. It says in Ezekiel, you know, he'll break our hearts of stone. That's what he'd done. So we surrounded him with love. We got him on a 12-step cocaine anonymous program. And they've been cleaning that stuff for six or seven years. And, and, and the eldest one is married and gave us two lovely grandchildren, uh, one uh, four-year-old little granddaughter who's absolutely amazing and she can do anything for me. That's, that's for sure. Where's this leading? Well, you know, nothing my friends will hit you as hard as life. I've been hit many times in the boxing ring and I've been hit very hard. And I can punch very quite hard as well, do you know? But nothing will hit you as hard as life. You can be, everything can be good, everything can be rosy, all of a sudden out of left field, something will hit you, something will sideswipe you. And as a man, what do we think? As a man we think, oh, I can do this, I can cope with this. And we try and self-medicate, we try and do things by ourselves. don't work we're in trouble that's why we need groups of men around us that's why we need groups of Christian men who we can do life with who we can go a bit deeper with we need groups of men that we can trust who we can go to with our struggles because otherwise on a Sunday morning say how are you I'm all right 
cup of tea, bit of cake, I'll see you next week. No. We've all go through problems. We've all got struggles, no matter how, whatever level that is. I'd just say, I'd encourage you to get a few guys around. You don't need a huge amount, just one or two men that know you and you know them. That's what the, the quest life's all about. It's about spending time with a father. It's about hearing what he's, got to, what he's got for you. But it's about doing life with each other, giving you the tools to get through this life because it ain't easy. It's victorious, but we weren't promised an easy life. That's for sure. One last story. I was in Luton, and um, has anyone ever been to Luton? You got out, okay, that's, uh, that's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> he was wearing a stab vest at the time. I was talking to a church in Luton, a big, big Luton Christian Fellowship, big church. And as I walked in the church, a lady came up to me, and she said, there's a guy a couple of rows back, John, and um, he was an Arsenal hooligan, and he's come here to see you make a fool of yourself. Oh, I said, well, crocky, I hope we're disappointing, <laughs> you know. And I looked out, there was a bald head, no teeth, broken nose, tattoos, and that was just his wife, you know, so. <laughs> so John was a tough guy, John. I started off, I thought we'd, we'd try and crack the ice, so, I, so uh, I said a couple of little jokes and then John never cracked a smile. And at the end of, the, at the end of it, um, I looked out and John was not there. I thought, oh, he's probably going down to the pub or something. Got fed up. As I walked off the, uh, the stage, the lady came up to me, she said, um, same lady, she said, John wants to see you outside. I thought, oh, crikey, what are we in for now? You know. So as I walked outside, there's John slumped against the wall of the church. Tears just flowing. See, the Holy Spirit had gone. Just slumped against the wall of the church. He looked at me and said, Simon, I never cried at my dad's funeral. He said, I can't stop crying now. He looked at me and he got up and he said, I just don't want to be angry anymore. And he fell into my arms and there and then the Holy Spirit came into his life. And he gave his life to, to the Lord there and then, and he's been an amazing servant of that church um, ever since. Why do I say that? I say that because of this. If there's a God that can change me, if there's a God can, that can turn around, around my two boys from drug addictions, if there's a God that can, that can turn around violent criminals and bring them together when, when once they were warned, if there's a God that can change someone like John, who was an angry man, he's got to be real, hasn't he? And if he's real, let me ask you this. If you're a Christian man here today, where is he in your life? What importance are you giving him? What priorities are you giving him? You see, I've heard <coughs> Nicky Gumbel preach on this many times. It's God, family, work, ministry. And if you work and your ministry is the same, well, that's right. But it's God first, family next. And people sometimes go, oh, I'm a Christian, but my life's all over the place. Yeah, because you're getting your priorities wrong. You might be even putting family before God. You may come to church. You may come to a Bible teaching. You may even come to all the men's stuff. But let me tell you this. And I'm saying this for myself as well here this morning. God doesn't want it up here. He wants it down here. He wants it in your heart. And he's saying to you, come, come to me. I want to know you. Come and get to know me. Put me first. Many men I, I speak to say, well, I've got family, I've got business, I've got work. But who gives you all that? Who gives you all that? God gives you all of that. It's not rocket science. Matthew 6, 33 tells us, seek first the kingdom. God wants you to meet him in a quiet place. He wants you to get to know him. He wants you to know him in here. You can know all the scriptures. You can know everything in here. But just drop 18 inches to here. And that's what he wants. He wants your heart. He wants to get to know you. I don't know what you've got time for. Some of you may have time for watching sport, playing golf, watching the TV. That's a big one, isn't it? TV's a big thing. Reading the papers, all that. But what, what time are you giving God? What time are you giving God? If I could do anything at all, I'd, I'd implore you 
And I, I'm saying this for me too, to look at, at wh where you are with, with the Lord and maybe just give him, give him a little bit more. He wants the first fruits. It says in Romans, if the, once the first fruits are there, everything else falls into place. He wants you, gentlemen. And, he, and when you start doing that, you'll start to hear from him in, in the most incredible way. And then you can start being obedient and then you can start walking with him because you've got it all right. And everything else will fall into place. I'm going to end with a prayer. I'm going to put out a challenge to, to every single man here today that we lay down what we think are, is important in our lives and we put God first. Just get the priorities right, fellas. And I'm including myself in this. So if this prayer is for you, then let's just say it in our hearts. The end will say amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you that you're there. We thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, sometimes we can't hear you because of the business of our lives. So, Lord, we say today, we're going to put down stuff that we think is important and replace it with you. We want to come to you with our hearts, not our minds. We want to come to you with our hearts. Lord, come in afresh today. Fill us afresh today. Let us walk afresh with your son, Jesus Christ. And from this day forward, let us always put you number one. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.